Uh, my name is Tim Lord, and I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and, and welcome to this event today, which is entitled Encrypting Smartphones and Internet Messages, Are Americans More or Less Secure? Um, this event is hosted in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus and its co-chairs. On the House side, it's um, Congressman Bob Goodlatte and Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. On the Senate side, our co-chairs for the Congressional Internet Caucus are Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy. Um, th since it's Throwback Thursday, I should mention the last time we did this issue, literally in encryption, was um, September of 1999, and, and I was here for it. Um, some, of the, some of the folks in the room have been too. Um, and this issue has um, come a long way. Uh, back then, uh, it, it wasn't as, encryption was very esoteric. People had no idea what encryption meant uh, in the general public. But today, we have these devices that have encryption built into them for, for privacy reasons and security reasons. Um, I even have a watch that has some level of encryption, I think. Um, these devices are everywhere. It's more relevant to um, Americans and consumers than it was back in 1999. And the issue is back, back. So we wanted to start getting, uh, having a public conversation about this, this issue, and we're glad that uh, folks have joined us today, and, and we have a great um, panel of speakers. I'm going to hand it over to, uh, be, to Tal Copen in just a second. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the, the Twitter hashtag is CryptoConvo, if you want to tweet. And um, our Twitter account is on this page, and as is the Twitter information for most of the panelists as well. So uh, uh, Tal Copen is a cybersecurity reporter for Politico, and she's been covering these issues, and she's awesome. And we want to just hand it over to Tal. Thanks, Tim, and thanks so much to the Net Caucus and its sponsors for having us. Uh, just a plug for myself, if you don't subscribe to my morning newsletter, Morning Cybersecurity, you should check it out. Uh, we have a wonderful panel with us today. Uh, to my left is David Bitkower, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division from the Department of Justice. Sitting next to him is Jen Ellis, the Senior Director of Community and Public Affairs for Rapid7, who uh, once told me that that title is a bit limiting. She's sort of a, a jack of all trades over there. Um, Amy Stepanovich from, uh, is the Senior Policy Counsel over at Access, and Heather West uh, is in Public Policy at Cloudfare. Um, but so we'll get started. As Tim mentioned, and he, he mentioned this to me as well in prepping for the panel that their last uh, event on this was in 1999, and for a long time we sort of referred, referred to the crypto wars as a thing of the past. Uh, so I wanted to start off with sort of each of you. Why do you think we're having this conversation again? Why are we in a sort of new crypto war era? David? Thank you, Tal, and I, I want to start by thanking the Congressional Internet Caucus for hosting this. Um, as I think folks have heard from a variety of different uh, organs of the government up to the president, this is an extremely important conversation for us and one we definitely want to be having, and uh, we want to make sure that um, the community at large understands where the government is coming from, uh, what our perspectives are, and, and what we actually uh, want to balance, and that is to understand that we uh, when I hear of something like crypto war, we don't see this as a war. Um, the government is not at war with cryptography. It is not at war with encryption. Uh, we value strong encryption. Uh, the government is a strong supporter of encryption in nearly every context. Um, uh, and uh, that's not the perspective we're bringing to this. The, the reason we're here, I think, is because we've seen changes in the way crime is committed and changes in the way crime has to be solved and prevented over the last a uh, few decades, uh, and that is a trend that has been increasing, and the implications of that trend have been changing. So just to, if I can take a second, I'd say, um, as someone who's been a prosecutor my entire career, I can tell you that access to electronic evidence is essential to ensuring public safety and national security in effectively every context. And so you think about it in computer crime cases, certainly, but access to electronic evidence is essential in child pornography cases. It's essential in white collar fraud cases. It's essential in public corruption cases. It's essential in gang cases. Um, and so I can give you examples across that spectrum, but there are cases where the evidence that we use to identify a perpetrator, prevent a crime, make sure somebody is held accountable for crime they've committed and victims are protected and a jury can be convinced uh, is going to be in electronic form, whether it's text messages, emails, stored videos, or wiretapping of live communications. Um, and when we approach the question of how can the government invade privacy and get access to that evidence, there has been a centuries-long conversation in this country about the appropriate balance between uh, the right to privacy in your communications and in your stored information, and on the other hand, the need for society in appropriate circumstances to have access 
to that evidence and the information that's necessary to enforce the laws and to solve crimes and keep people safe. Uh, and generally speaking, that balance has wound up in the area where if an individual has what's called a reasonable expectation of privacy, uh, law enforcement can go to a court, demonstrate probable cause that there will be evidence uh, or fruits of a crime in a certain place and get a warrant and that will authorize you to get that information. That standard has been applied across a wide variety of technologies, a wide variety of contexts. Uh, you see the Supreme Court um, grappling with these issues and ruling in some circumstances where a warrant wasn't previously required, now a warrant should be required. And you see this sort of developing through that conversation. What we're seeing now, and I think why we're here today again in 2015, is the advent of not just encryption, but the change in sort of the advent of widespread commercially available encryption across mainstream consumer devices threatens to change that balance. In fact, not just change that balance, it threatens to make that balance, that careful calibration of a balance of power, utterly irrelevant in the sense that government can still assemble probable cause that evidence is in a certain place and is needed to identify a criminal or solve a crime, still go to a court, get a warrant, but that warrant effectively is, a, is no better than a piece of paper because the information cannot be accessed without the permission of the ultimate end user or end possessor. And that's, that's the threat we're worried about. That is, the unilateral uh, change that technology can bring about that can render irrelevant the complicated and um, long-standing constitutional balance that we've reached over the number of years. So again, it's not a question of uh, encryption is bad. Quite the contrary. Government is a, is a, is a primary consumer of strong encryption. Um, we support it not just for our own purpose, but obviously the commerce uh, uh, interests of America obviously are strongly intertwined with that. The privacy interests of Americans are strongly dependent on strong encryption. And so that's not, it is not at all a conflict between a technology and a principle, right? You can't have a conflict between a technology and a principle. You have a conflict between two principles. So one principle that we are espousing, that law enforcement believes strongly in is, in certain circumstances, there needs to be an ability for those who are in charge with protecting public safety to access certain information. And that is irreconcilable with a different principle, which is it should always be up to the person who has the information whether someone else can access it. So if, it, if, if you say it's always up to the, uh, the pedophile who has child pornography stored in their computer, that is in conflict with the principle that law enforcement should, in appropriate circumstances, be able to access information. But there's not a conflict between the use of encryption or the security of data and law enforcement access. So what we want to do is, and the reason you'll see the government out there in these various contexts, is to have a conversation about how to balance those principles of data security, uh, public safety, national security, privacy, in a way that makes sense, um, but not to uh, have any impression that we are somehow at odds with folks who want to keep their information secure. To the contrary, we have common cause with them. Okay. Jen? Um, okay. oh, I have to push that one. Um, so I think, yeah, from a law for enforcement point of view, I think the reason we're having the conversation again is that technology isn't everything we do. And that's not going to diminish, it's going to increase. Um, so I can, I can see the angle from that point of view. Um, I think the other reason we're having the debate is that from a security point of view, we haven't yet managed to find a way to talk about security in really simple terms and help people really understand what the implications are. There's still like an awareness issue, an education issue, whereby if you ask most people in the security community who've been around for a while, they'll share with you that they have a certain amount of frustration over having these conversations again and again and again. And it's not just in crypto, it's in every area. We continue to have to tell people the same thing again, and we continue to see the same issues come up over and over again, the same kinds of attacks come up over and over again, the same kind of issues in technology come up again. And <clears throat> we are, we're not necessarily learning the lessons from the past effectively and moving forward to uh, rise to meet new challenges. We're still dwelling on the old challenges because we haven't solved them yet. So I think a big part of it is about awareness and understanding and communication and really trying to help people understand why, yeah, law enforcement is really important. And we can't, you know, we can't overlook that. It's incredibly important that we find a solution that works for law enforcement. 
But we have to understand the technology and we have to understand what we're really talking about here. We have to talk, we understand what security means and what the implications of undermining it are. And so I think that's really why we're still having the same conversation is we've not effectively achieved that yet. So um, I understand the last time you guys had this conversation was a very long time ago. The last time I had it was a few hours ago, so I apologize to anybody who has to hear me say the same thing over again. Um, I would say that the balance actually, the balance between privacy and security shifted a long time ago when the internet started becoming something that we use every single day and we became incredibly connected and all of a sudden the data streams that we were creating about our daily movements, our daily communications, our daily interactions, just exponentially expanded. So in an area where we talk about law enforcement going dark because of encryption, they've actually spent the last decade or longer going very, very bright with information about individuals and about users. Um, we talk about reasonable expectation of privacy and there's a really, really great process that we have in place when law enforcement believes that a user has a reasonable expectation of privacy, but in a lot of this information, they don't think that's the case. And so just a few years ago, the government was in the Supreme Court arguing that they could track a user's location without a warrant for at least a month long period without any process whatsoever. Um, and that would be an incredibly, I think, invasive scenario if you think about your movements over the period of a month to think that that could all go into a government database and be collected. Um, we haven't yet found a way to encrypt that information, the metadata information, and there's a lot of it out there. What we can encrypt are your communications and some of your other online interactions. And so shifting the balance back toward a world where a lot of your information is kept by you, where it's your data, where it is protected, and where it's not accessible. Um, the issue isn't that it's not acceptable, accessible by law enforcement. We would not say that we're anti-law enforcement, and I would echo um, Jen's point that law enforcement is incredibly important. Um, but we are pro-user, and we do think that users should be able to be secure that their communications are not going to be intercepted by unauthorized parties, bad actors, um, God forbid, repressive governments and areas um, that aren't as secure as the United States. And I think specifically, actually, this conversation that we're having today and the idea that we're talking about the crypto wars again stemmed from not encryption and not revisiting um, Kalia, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit later, but a revelation, one of the Snowden revelations that came about um, about a year and a half, two years ago, that the NSA was undermining encryption standards produced by the National Institute for Standards and Technologies. So not that they were requesting backdoors, not that they were looking for vulnerabilities, but the very foundation of all encryption across the internet as established um, by a previously believed to be very independent, very trustworthy US government agency was being undermined in order to increase the surveillance capabilities of other entities within the US government. So there are, why I bring this up is because there are a lot of other avenues that the government has found available to them outside of mandating less secure, more vulnerable technologies for all of you to use in your daily interactions, outside of making you more vulnerable in order to get access to the information that they believe that they need to conduct their investigations. Um, so I'll leave that vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities and I know we're going to get into that a little later, but whether it's a front door or a back door or any door into a system or a network or a piece of technology, it's a door that not only one party can walk through, but any bad actor who can find a way to figure out where that is can go through and can get access to your information. Thanks. This is, a, this is a tough crowd to follow because I think that David, Jen, and Amy did a good job of talking through all of this. Um, at Cloudflare, we have a fairly you know, philosophical approach to encryption. We think encryption is good. We think that securing our users' um, you know, data and the websites that, that you know, transit our network is good. Um, and and we, we consider encryption to be one of the many tools that we can use uh, to help keep our customers secure and make sure that the internet broadly is secure. Um, and because we think of it as a tool, um, we, we tend to think of it um, 
as something that, that we can either make stronger or make weaker. And, and in some of these debates, suggestions have been made uh, that we think would make encryption weaker, that would make the internet weaker. Uh, and specifically, you know, we work very closely with law enforcement to make sure that, that they, they have the information they need from us. Um, but we also have to balance the tools that we give our users uh, because law enforcement is not the only people that might be after their information. Uh, we need to use that strong encryption to make sure that, that people, you know, in these repressive governments that, that Amy, or under these oppressive governments that Amy mentioned, have the ability to, to look at websites and maybe their government doesn't know what they're looking at. And that's, I think, a net win for free speech. That's a net win for, for democracy. Um, Amy also mentioned um, you know, the, the idea of law enforcement going dark versus this golden age of surveillance that some people have talked about. Uh, and I actually wanted to mention there's a fantastic article that at this point I think is four or five years old uh, by Peter Swire and Kamisa Ahmed that kind of picks apart some of the some of the arguments on both sides of that and, and has a thoughtful discussion. Um, I don't, if I recall correctly, I don't think they came up with a, a genius solution. I think if anyone had come up with a perfect solution, we wouldn't be here discussing this. Um, you know, but you know, we're having this discussion because I think it is true. They're, the tools are becoming more accessible and more usable by a broad swath of users, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but you know, we need to be working with law enforcement to make sure that they have the information they need without weakening encryption. And um, I promise we won't let this panel become everybody gang up on David and the <laughs> DOJ. But, uh, you know, to press a little bit. So a lot of this kicked off when uh, FBI Director James Comey <clears throat> came out and, and really started leading the charge that has been followed up by the Attorney General and the Justice Department uh, that law enforcement needs to be able to <clears throat> break encryption and current device makers like Apple and Google are marketing devices with encryption by default that the companies are saying, even we won't be able to break. So the presumption is law enforcement then, even if they got a warrant, wouldn't be able to get in. Um, you know, there was a recent event where uh, members of the crowd and the security community were really pressing, I believe it was Admiral Mike Rogers on this issue. Uh, it, what has happened is the security community is saying, what you are describing is not possible, uh, that we can't build a system this way. So the question is, you know, we're talking, we, we're talking about the principles of law enforcement, the principles of encryption, but the technology matters. And, and what is the Department of Justice and, and the law enforcement community really hoping we can accomplish on sort of a practical level here? Uh, and is there a way to satisfy the security community on that? Well, thanks, Tal. I, I think that's the key question. And, and I, I want to key off something that, that Heather actually just said, which I completely agree with, which is that encryption is a tool, right? Encryption is not a principle. It's not an ideology. It's a tool that we use to pursue <clears throat> other goals, and, and in particular, protection of privacy and protection of personal data. The goal of encryption is to make sure your data is secure from people who shouldn't see it, but can be used and viewed by people who should see it. Encryption doesn't tell you anything about who those people are or what those circumstances are. That's a choice that society makes. That's a choice that the user weighs into. And so the goal of this debate is not to say we should weaken encryption. Quite the contrary. The goal is not to say that the government wants to break encryption, and I don't think those are the words that you'll hear folks using. The government doesn't like to break encryption. The goal is, can we find a solution that gets the benefits of encryption and keeping data secure from people who it shouldn't go to, but is able to deliver it to people to whom it should go to? And how do we decide the question of who is who? That's not a technological question. That's a policy question. And what we're concerned about is the technology risks taking that policy question off the table and deciding because of the widespread availability of user-controlled encryption that only the, the smartphone holder or only the particular communicants to a call have a right to say whether someone can see that information or get access to that information. And that is not the principle that is a standard American um, principle for the last couple of hundred years. It's just not. The principle has been that in certain circumstances, where appropriate, where we can balance liberty and security, and I get that those balances change all the time, um, and those balances are applied differently in different contexts, but we can't rule out the possibility that law enforcement or other folks in charge of uh, protecting public safety can access information. Now, is it possible to do that? I've, we've heard the same arguments, of course, that um, mandating a solution um, for uh, government in some circumstances to be able to access the data or for provider to be able to access it and give it to government is somehow unacceptably weakening of encryption. And, and I think we need to challenge that 
presumption because again that is that risks going from sort of a careful analysis to more of sort of a, an ideological position and in fact I think we've seen over a number of contexts that there are ways of developing encryption solutions that keep data acceptably secure using strong encryption that is very difficult or impossible to break other than you know after thousands of years of computation um, but that makes the data available in a way that is acceptably secure and I think you just look back not that long ago, before last fall, I think most of us were carrying smartphones that could be decrypted by the provider. Uh, and I don't think most of us consider that unacceptably insecure. In fact, most of us used them on a daily basis and kept personal information on there. I think most of us, uh, many, many tens or hundreds of millions of people, including most Americans, use email services that are provided by major providers that are not solely encrypted uh, and readable to the end user. They're in fact decrypted and readable to the provider itself and can be uh, employed consistent with wiretap orders and can also be accessed by other folks for other purposes. And we don't consider that unacceptably insecure or somehow not true, not true encryption. It is encryption, it's just differently implemented. And I think if you look, uh, just to give one more example, I think in most enterprise contexts, so we're talking about corporations which have billions and billions of dollars, their most sensitive trade secrets, um, whatever is the most important to the most important American companies, right, the most major American companies, they use encryption, but they don't entrust the only key to one employee who might forget it or who might um, swallow it and, and move to another country and not give it back or who might sell it uh, on the black market and take all of the, the crown jewels of a company and give it to somebody else. Most major enterprises use key management to make sure that data is available to different folks at different times uh, in accordance with their own business model. So I think we're trying to approximate something like that that is appropriate key management or some other appropriate solution that makes data available where it should be available but doesn't beg the question of to whom it should be available. And um, moderator's prerogative, an another little bit of scene setting, well, you know, to lead into Jen, who I know works a lot with the security research community, one of the things that is in the ether as we talk about this is a recently discovered vulnerability called Freak. Uh, they, the researchers love naming these things. Um, but it, it's based on a policy in the 90s that mandated that encryption that was exported overseas was of a lesser grade than in the US. And I'm not implying that that's what DOJ is advocating here. But that policy sort of came to roost now where modern encrypted devices can be tricked into sort of reassuming that lower level of encryption. And it's being raised as an example of, you know, even when we try to solve this in a reasonable way, we see the problems with it. So Jen, I know you work a lot with the security research community. Why are they so concerned by some of what we're talking about? Um, yeah, thanks. So you, you mentioned uh, that the community had said, you know, it's, it's not possible. And um, there's a nuance on that. Um, and it goes back to what Amy said, which is um, a vulnerability is a vulnerability. So I'll say it is possible because we build technology every day that has vulnerabilities in it. Uh, we do it intentionally. Uh, no, we do it unintentionally because vulnerabilities are really bad. They create an opportunity for attackers. So we don't want to create those opportunities. And if you put an, an intentional way for somebody to uh, break encryption into encryption, that's a vulnerability pure and simple. So that's why the community has an issue with it. Um, the challenge is that um, encryption is something that you have to make you secure. If you intentionally and inherently undermine that, you, you nullify the value of it from the very beginning. There is no point in having it, except it's worse, because now you have a false sense of security. I'm, I'm kind of a simple creature, so I like analogies, and I've been trying to think of a good analogy for this, and I, I, I'm not entirely sure that I've succeeded. Um, but I, I think, you know, I try and think about something that you might create to make somebody feel safer. So let's say that tomorrow we developed this amazing new form of body armor, head-to-toe body armor. We rolled it out across the US military, but we wanted to make sure that in case anybody else stole the blueprints of the body armor, um, that the US had a way of combating it. So we also developed a weapon that could defeat this. I, I mean, how many of you would feel comfortable with that? Do you feel like we'd be able to keep control of that situation? Because I don't think we have a good track record in keeping control of these situations. And Freak kind of demonstrates that. 
we we have a problem that um, well, actually we have a problem with gun control. So that kind of highlights the fact that when you create uh, a means of attack, that means of attack will be used by others. That that will always happen. It will always propagate. And right now, the reason that the secu security, excuse me, is such a hot topic, and that I, I think a lot of people care about it, is because we're not really winning the fight. At the moment, the attackers have a huge amount of opportunity. There's a booming cybercrime economy, and we we've created a massive attack surface, and. The, the goal of encryption is to address some of that. The goal of encryption is to actually diminish that attack surface, to make it much harder for people to attack us. And if we intrinsically build in a door, you know, to, to Amy's point, a door is a door. It really doesn't matter where that door is. Once you have that door, people are going to walk through it. And, and yeah, I understand. Sometimes you give people, like your neighbors, a set of, key, a set of keys to your house. But you make the choice on that. You don't go out one day and come back and find that the government broke down your door. And if you do, that's typically a concern. And so, you know, if your neighbor decided to hand out keys to your house, you'd be like, hang on a second, <laughs> what just happened to me? <laughs> so I think, you know, it, it is down to, to our choice who we give access to the information to. And as I said before, I do think that there needs to be a way that we can work with law enforcement. I do think that law enforcement priorities are important. But I don't think that undermining a system that we've built to make ourselves more secure is the way to do it. And Amy, what about uh, you know David's point that this is this is a policy question that it's a question of of who and how you know I know your organization fights for privacy on a broad spectrum. So how does this debate sort of play into that question? Sure. Um, so we talked a little bit about balance. Actually, balance is a word that I've come over many years to really hate, because balance is typically trotted out as a means to say, you all should give up a lot of your rights so we can have a lot more power over you. Um, and I don't necessarily think that that's a really great situation to be in. Um, I don't know if I want to trust it to other people and to other um, actors to determine what an acceptable level of security should be. Um, if I believe that when I use a specific technology or a specific tool that it operates at a specific level of security and I'm making a choice to use that tool based on that, it shouldn't necessarily be the case that it is not as secure as I think it is because somebody has made a policy decision that I've never heard of before to build in a weakness or a vulnerability into that that allows potentially, or in theory, only one party or only one company to get access to that information, but could also open it up to other people and to other parties to gain access. And in other contexts in the US government, they actually, we talk a lot about how cybercrime is really on the rise, that people are now more vulnerable, that people's information is more vulnerable, that you should take actions, that you should protect your data, because data breaches are going up, and photo breaches, your iPhone is being hacked and all of your photos are being taken. Your information is really insecure, actually, if you look at it from an umbrella perspective. And now we're talking about going into that. And instead of mandating that you have the strongest encryption available, the strongest protection available, I actually agree that encryption is a tool. And I think that um, we've discussed recently, should we mandate encryption? I actually think that's a step backward. You shouldn't mandate encryption because there's going to be something that comes next that's even better and even more secure and even more robust and can protect your information to a higher degree. But right now we, we have encryption and that's a really one of the best things that we have. And I think that we should be able to deploy the strongest encryption available because even with that encryption, it's going to be, it's going to be wrong. Um, as, as we've said, you can't necessarily make encryption perfect. And I'm not a technologist. I don't have a technology background. Um, but people who do um, and who are much smarter than I am on the tools and the technology that are available out there have told me over and over again, we can't get it right. We can't get it right when we're trying to get it right. When we want to build encryption without vulnerabilities, we can't necessarily make it happen. So what happens when you're trying to build encryption with vulnerabilities? It actually is a huge step backward, I think. And, and Heather, you know, Please jump on if you're going to, but I also wanted to um, 
turn the conversation a little bit, as someone who works for a company that has to deal with law enforcement requests, how do you guys go about that? And what about the suggestion that for a long time we were fine with companies being able to sort of be the keeper of the right to our data? Sure. I, I, um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, what you know, David said, as, and I'm happy to talk about that, the law enforcement aspect of that as well. Um, you know, first off, I think we need to step back for just two seconds uh, and, and, and make sure that everyone understands there's a lot of different kinds of encryption. There's encryption at rest. Maybe my phone is encrypted at rest. Um, there's encryption in transit, so Cloudflare encrypts our, our customers' uh, data in transit um, so that people can't, you know, Try to try to listen in on the network uh, as it transits. Um, there's there's this you know centralized model where it's encrypted to a centralized server, and then you know the the gatekeeper can can read it for for whatever reason. Um, I just want to make sure that that folks understand that there's not one monolithic encryption in the world. Um, and, and David mentioned uh, kind of enterprise use of encryption, which I think is really important. Um, companies now a lot of times are required by various regulations to use in encryption and to safeguard those keys. And yes, they're going to have some sort of key management system. Um, uh, but for example, we have a lot of financial industry customers who want their data to be encrypted to the best, to the best of their ability. Um, and they came to us and they said, we really want to use your service, but there is no way we are giving you our key even though we trust you. Uh, and, and so we built a solution for that so that we don't ever have to hold on to their key because they don't, it's not only, it's not that they don't trust us, it's that it's an, you know, a risk that they're not willing to take. Um, so, so that maybe, you know, is, is an example of kind of taking this problem and saying, okay, so maybe we can be a little bit creative about this. Maybe we can figure out a way to deal with this. Um, but, but I do think that, that, you know, handing out the key or sharing the key outside of an organization uh, is, is a risk that people have to take into account when they're thinking about how to balance this. Um, I do think that that's, you know, you mentioned Freak, uh, that those legacy policies of weakening the tool uh, has now put users at risk globally. Uh, and I don't think that's a good outcome. And I think we should be, as we figure out what the right answer is here, we should make sure that, that it's one that, that addresses users globally and, and doesn't end up down the road putting people at risk. Can I just follow up? No. So, um, to follow up on your comment about enterprise solutions, when you're selling an encryption solution to an enterprise, uh, I understand the idea that your company wouldn't keep a key. But when you're trying to figure out what the appropriate solution is for an enterprise, uh, is it your company's position that the only appropriate solution is that one person, the ultimate user, has the key? Or do you also have solutions where different individuals within the company can manage the key so it can be available for the purposes that the company wants? Oh, that company management is all entirely up to them. Um, we, you know, I, I, would, I think of the company more as a single entity, and it's their, in my mind, their right to, to manage their key. Um, we, we take a very strong stance. We don't share our key uh, externally outside Cloudflare. We don't share our customers' keys if they have chosen to share them with us. Um, but, but in our... Um, in our model, it's up to them to choose how they want to do that. We have a bunch of different encryption options um, depending on how, how they feel um, best setting it up. But so you, I, I take it you would then agree with the principle that strong encryption can be entirely consistent with providing access to more than one person. If, if it's not, yes, if it's not end-to-end -end encrypted, certainly. Um, but that goes back to the different models of encryption. There are some that are set up so that that can be, you know, done relatively easily, and there are some that are set up in a way that that is technically very difficult. Um, and that, that goes back to my thoughts about encryption as a tool. Um, so so for, certainly for some of them, that is absolutely possible. Um, and, and I do think, um, you know, one of the things that, that I want to be very, very clear about here is, is um, you know, we don't want to be all ganging up on law enforcement on this, on this panel. They do a very important job. Uh, and I have been, I'm relatively new at Cloudflare, and one of the things that made me very pleased when I, when I started is to realize that we have very good relationships with law enforcement, mutual respect, um, and everyone kind of understands where everyone's boundaries are. Uh, and, and that has served as a very productive way to kind of answer some of these questions. And obviously, we haven't figured out how to balance all of them. Um, again, that's why we're here. Uh, but, but I think that there, there is a balance to be found. Uh, and I, I really hope that at the end of this, this debate, whether we want to call it a crypto war or whatever, not, not today, we're not going to solve it today. Um, but when we kind of come to conclusion of this discussion, um, we have something that everyone's moderately happy with. And uh, I think we can tell we have an attorney in the room. <laughs> uh, 
David, I wanted to um, bring up the point that I know frustrates uh, the criminal division quite a bit, which um, we touched on a bit before, this notion of the NSA revelations. Um, the government uh, has this golden age of surveillance. Uh, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to that and talk about why the Justice Department is frustrated by those conversations. Sure, thank you. And so I think <laughs> When we talk about the gold age of surveillance, I think there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of issues that have to be mentioned. One is sort of a conceptual um, incoherency to that to that um, paradigm that I that I hear fairly frequently, which is um, that now there is evidence on phones and you didn't have evidence on phones before, so why are you complaining that you have only half the evidence on phones? That's better than zero. Um, and there's a couple of answers to that. One is. First of all, that's where the evidence has migrated to. So there used, people used to write letters. Nobody writes letters anymore. They send emails. Um, people used to keep their child pornography uh, on 8-tracks, uh, and then they kept them on CD-ROMs. But now they keep them on digital storage devices with terabytes of storage capacity. And so yes, are we getting more terabytes of data than we got before? Absolutely. Um, but that's because that's where the evidence is. If Again, the balance of how much evidence um, government should get and when government should invade your privacy is not measured in terabytes. It's not measured in quantity of data. It's measured on balancing the right to privacy with the need for law enforcement access. And that's the probable cause standard. That's the reasonable expectation of privacy standard. And if we've met that standard, it doesn't serve a privacy interest to say, well, it really ought to be harder for government to do its job. If we can solve more crimes, um, with the same effort, I think most Americans would think that would be a good thing. If we can solve more crimes with the same money, I think most Americans would think that's a good thing, that's not a bad thing. The point is that we should be respecting the balance of privacy that we've set through the laws and through our courts and making sure we're respecting that balance, but then doing our best to solve crimes. Now, in terms of the NSA issue, I'm, I'm not the person to speak about what the NSA can or can't do, obviously. Um, when we talk about strong encryption that takes years to break, the math is the math. It takes years to break no matter what hat you're wearing, um, or it takes centuries to break or millennia to break no matter what hat you're wearing. Um, but this is not a case uh, where it only affects intelligence equities, obviously, right? Digital evidence, as I said at the very beginning, is strewn throughout the cases we see. So there were roughly 2,000 child pornography cases at the federal level last year alone. 2,000 prosecutions of people keeping uh, pro of child pornography. There was about 200 where people were producing child pornography at the federal level alone. I'm not even talking about states and locals. So this is an everyday issue where if we, th if we allow the technology to determine that um, n only one person can choose whether there is access, A, that's inconsistent with what we're telling people about strong encryption in the commercial context, but it also would have tremendous effects on the average uh, law enforcement investigation. So 20 years ago, maybe it was the smartest criminals who knew how to use encryption and keep their stuff secure. When we roll encryption out in, in widespread consumer available devices, it's, it takes, it's, now we're at your average criminal. So we're gonna have any criminal with the right kind of smartphone, any criminal who knows which text messaging service to use will have the abilities of what only the smartest criminal had before. And so now it's the sheriff of Mayberry who's trying to catch up with that. And they're not gonna be using uh, classified surveillance tools or what have you. They're gonna be stuck serving a search warrant to decrypt a, uh, to search a laptop computer, which they have probable cause has child pornography, which searching, there again, there's probable cause to believe this will protect a victim, perhaps even rescue a victim. And it just can't be done because the technology has made that choice for us. So again, no one is mandating or suggesting we should mandate weakening of encryption. No one is suggesting any particular solution at all at this point. What we're saying is, let's have a conversation about whether it's a good idea to let the technology make the choice or whether it's a good idea to have society make the choice. And we have to recognize the dangers of putting forth um, broadly available to every individual user, whether they're law-abiding or not law-abiding, whether they mean to help us or to harm us, to give them the complete control and to say government, uh, society at large, has absolutely no role in that conversation. If your employee said, I will not work for your company unless I have complete control over all the data in this company and no one else can have a key to it, my guess is they wouldn't be your employee for very long. And when we talk about this as a society, again, no one unit of society should be able to make that call for the rest of the country. Amy, I'm going to kick it over to you. 
So yeah, um, I, I think, first of all, there's an important distinction to be made here. There is a lot of evidence that has shifted digitally, that existed before in a non-digital context and has shifted. Um, but a lot of the information that is generated is brand new. We didn't used to be able to go out to a cell phone tower and get tons of location information about individuals. If you wanted to know where somebody was from day to day, you put an officer on them and you had them watched day to day to day. Um, and it's not a matter of getting this information at the same cost or more information. It's a matter of like exponential decreases in the cost of surveillance. Um, there's a fantastic paper that was published um, by Kevin Bankston and Ashkan Sultani, who's now the chief technologist at the FTC, on the cost of surveillance and how we are now able to get so much information about individuals for pennies, um, if not even cheaper than pennies. Um, so we have this ever decreasing ability to get large amounts of information. Encryption and um, protected data streams actually typically take it out of a world where you can monitor a wire and get a lot of information and pool it in a bulk or mass scenario and make it that you have to target an individual and go after one person or one party um, and not necessarily that you can get massive streams of data. So it does kind of start to f shift that back to a more expensive, less, um, tar or less bulk model. And I think that's also important to point out, that we're not saying we should shut off all access. There are many, I, I started with this, there are many, many different ways that law enforcement finds access to individuals' information. One of them is going to the carriers. Oftentimes, I mean, if you're communicating with somebody, there are two parties to that communication. So it's not that one person only has the information. There is another party to go to. Much of the information is backed up to the cloud. So even if it's on your encrypted device, you can go to the cloud and the provider still has access to that information. Um, we've had hard drive encryption on computers for a very long time. We're now just seeing it on cell phones. But back in 2013, I mean, if we're talking about going dark and the problem of going dark, um, the wiretap report from 2013 showed that there were only nine instances, nine times when encryption prevented ac law enforcement access to content. And so of all of the cases in 2013 where a wiretap was sought encryption only interrupted that p process in nine cases. And we have no details about it, but presumably it didn't interrupt the investigation and make the investigation impossible. It may have made it a little more difficult and law enforcement may have had to find a different way around that encryption. But we're not seeing a scenario where this is preventing criminals from being caught. What it is preventing is bad people from getting access to your information in a way that harms you as a user of a device. I don't want to. Uh just want to respond to the, the, the point about the wiretap report. Uh, and I assume you have some understanding of sort of how it is that wiretaps get applied for and granted. The way a wiretap application works is agents collect evidence in an investigation that a certain communication device is being used in furtherance of criminal activity. They write it up in an affidavit along with other evidence in the case to demonstrate to a judge that there's probable cause that that device is being used and we want to be able to get access to that evidence to solve the crime. Um, we then present it to, after it gets approved within high levels in the department, it then gets presented to a judge who can sign it, and then if they sign it, you serve it on the provider. Um, if law enforcement agents know at the front end that a certain communication technology is not vulnerable to wiretapping, they don't keep applying for it. So the fact that something may have been declined nine times doesn't mean there are only nine cases where that technology is being used. In fact, it says almost nothing about the number of cases where it's being used. If you want to know the number of cases where certain technology is being used um, that can't be wiretapped, you know what those technologies are. It's not my job, of course, to advertise any particular technology to folks who want to avoid surveillance, um, but it's not really a secret um, which technology companies available, certain uh, advertised technology is not vulnerable to wiretapping. And so um, I think it, as long as you know that those are being used, by regular people for law-abiding purposes, you can be pretty confident being used by criminals as well, and I can tell you they are. And, yeah. Go ahead. Well, just, you can respond, but I also wanted to throw in, you know, one of the suggestions that Comey has thrown out there is updating CALEA um, and wiretapping laws to require more things to be built in such a way that they could be wiretapped, if we want to talk about that a little bit as well as you um, respond. <laughs> Sure, so there are a lot of instances where law enforcement have made very, very public statements about going dark. And typically they come with two different pieces of the statements. The first piece is explaining 
why they need um, potentially a CLIA II, and I'll get into that in just a second. Um, and typically, it's for exigent circumstances, circumstances where they need inf access to information very quickly, or in circumstances where the information may disappear. Um, and then the second part of the statement is always, now let me provide a lot of examples about why these instances come into play. And the problem is, is when you start parsing out those circumstances that they're provided with the justifications that they're giving, they don't always match up. And so I would love to know exactly what circumstances we're trying to combat, because if we're having a public conversation about the need of Kalia too, and again, I will get to that in just a second, um, it's really hard to have a public conversation about what that would look like if you don't know exactly all of the problems that are being solved. And so when you get to Kalia II and the idea that you can take um, a, a law that requires technology not to be as secure as it could be and applying it to the internet, you get a very problematic scenario. And if you look at just the phone service that Kalia already applies to, um, and I highly, if you're interested in the phone scenario, I suggest you talk to Chris Segoyan, who's at the ACLU, who knows more about phone encryption than I think anybody alive today. Um, the phone system in the US and around the world is actually incredibly weak. It's very simple with a couple hundred dollars of equipment to build a device that can listen in on your phone calls because we don't have good encryption on our phone system. I don't know if we want to get to a point in the future and potentially the near future where for a couple hundred dollars I can intercept all of the communications, the electronic communications that come out of your phone as well. Um, because that's a very, very scary situation to be in. And I will say, and I'm not necessarily an expert in UK law, but I did spend the weekend looking over it because the UK Home Office is now requesting comments on a proposal, um, a procedural proposal that is implementing a law that was passed last year. The UK has a CALEA type provision. It does apply to the internet because they define the internet as a telecommunication service. And now they're saying that they can use that in situations where a company has customers in the UK. So they've applied this extraterritorially now in a way that any, basically any internet company can be forced um, by the UK government to build in some sort of vulnerability. And so this isn't just about the US, it's not just about China, it's about some of our partners as well. And these are partners that can potentially send this information to the US or send it to other countries under secret agreements that we've never seen, we probably will never see, and then that information just gets backdoored into a database in the US system anyway. So again, there are tons of ways that law enforcement finds to access this information um, or that other agencies find to access this information. Yeah, so, so um, from, from Cloudflare's perspective, um, I say we're a user trust company a lot. Um, and and it, because that's because what we really go back to is user trust. Um, if, if, we, if, we, you know, if, if laws like Korea get passed uh, for the internet, uh, asking for those back doors, I think that that degrades user trust in the internet, in Cloudflare, in all of these companies. Um, and I think that increases you know, the threat to their information a lot, you know, if 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 a sophisticated criminal knows that there is a you know one key that will open every lock, um, they're probably not going to go trying to see which doors are open. They're just going to go for that key, uh, and that you know worries me, and I think would set trust in the internet back significantly. Um, you know, I think that there, as I've said, is a is a better way to go forward on that once we figure out what it is. <laughs> the details are hard. Uh, so I think that's right. I mean, I think that's the framework we need to be thinking in, and I, I think I'm hearing this from Amy as well, that is, um, obviously, um, and this is a truism, if you create a means of access for anyone, whether it's law enforcement or the owner or the owner's manager or the owner's neighbor, um, that creates a theoretical additional vulnerability. And the question is, how great is that vulnerability in the context of the current level of data security. And then on the other side of the equation, how great are the dangers if we don't have availability for law enforcement to get access to that in certain circumstances? So, um, you know, assuming that the number is higher than nine cases, obviously, because that's a measure of the number of times law enforcement was mistaken and thought they had access, not the number of times they didn't have access. Um, so if you have child pornographers who know that they can use a certain data at rest storage system and not have any risk of that being 
um, access by law enforcement, that's a danger. And I think we would all agree that's a danger. If we have a communication service that can't be penetrated, and this is what the president said in California a couple weeks ago, where you know there's a, um, a terrorist plot afoot, and you know that these two people are communicating, but you don't know what they're saying, and you can't penetrate it, that's a problem. And if you're arguing that law enforcement shouldn't have access, or that access should be entirely up to the user, you need to own that. And you need to recognize that there's trade-offs. And there's trade-offs when you adopt certain kinds of encryption. There's trade-offs when you have access points to that encryption. And you have to gauge which trade-offs are bigger than others. Now, um, when folks talk about cybercrime, which is a tremendously grave problem, as Amy points out, and it's something that we talk about fairly frequently, that is, companies that are doing everything right are still getting hacked. Uh, and they're getting hacked because the adversaries are extremely skilled, and they're going to find vulnerabilities wherever they are. Um, and in addition, uh, as is rightly pointed out, there are other ways law enforcement can access data besides the encrypted uh, device or the encrypted communications mechanism. Sometimes the information is available from one of the parties to the conversation. Sometimes it's available from the cloud where it may have been backed up with less, um, with less protection. So that's absolutely right. Um, the question is, do we acknowledge that this is a debate we have to have, we have to weigh the dangers from limiting access and creating unilateral decision-making power in the hands of threat actors as well as law-abiding people? Um, or is it enough to just say there is a theoretical additional incremental risk from having law enforcement access, therefore the conversation must end? And I think you know where law enforcement is coming from in that side of the debate. But that's the policy discussion we have to have. And what we're saying is not mandating back doors. We're not saying mandate any one solution at all. We're saying we need to talk to the private sector companies about this, about what's available. We need to talk to technologists. But we have to evaluate those risks, and we have to make sure we don't get in a situation where that debate is off the table because um, the unilateral technological fact has obviated the entire policy discussion. There are a couple of points I wanted to whoa, uh, wanted to respond to. Um, so the first that confused me was this idea that um, that if we uh, if we have perfect in, if we have imperfect encryption if we if we create backdoors that um, that that will solve the problem of bad guys using encryption. Bad, bad guys will find other solutions. They'll go build something. That that's kind of what they do when they. Uh, want to avoid law enforcement. So uh, th that's the first thing that I just think is like a, a, an initial premise that I'm not entirely sure this is actually going to solve the problem because sophisticated bad guys like um, your, your web of evil child pornographers, they will find another solution um, to get around this. Uh, the, the second thing is um, you made a, a great point, which is that there is a huge cybercrime challenge and companies are getting hacked every day because, as you said, because of vulnerabilities. And yet here we are talking about building in more vulnerabilities, this time intentionally. Yes, vulnerabilities in our technical systems are a massive problem and they undermine our technical systems. They undermine our ability to do business. They undermine the privacy of our citizens. And so inherently undermining and, and intentionally undermining the systems we put in to make us more secure, the whole purpose of encryption is the bad guys are out there, they're attacking us. They may get in. So what can we do so that when we're storing data internally or, com or communicating data, that data is as protected as possible? So you know, if they do get in, they're not instantly on the sofa with their feet up. <laughs> um, yeah. I, David, I see you want to jump in, but I want to make sure there's time for audience questions. So why don't we open it up to you all. Uh, if you have a question, um, please raise your hand and do we have a mic? No. No questions. Oh. <laughs> Dave. Uh, Dave Prayer from uh, Political Pro. Just a coincidence, we're both here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Big Power. So, you said you don't want to undermine encryption. I assume you're not talking about a clipper chip. I assume you're not talking about key escrow. You say there's a debate. Unless you have a solution, what's the solution? Why have a debate? 
<laughs> That's a great question. I mean, and obviously, I'm not here with a solution today, and the government is not presenting any particular legislative fix right now. That's the result, hopefully, of the national conversation, right? That's the result of talking to people in discussions like this and having the president out there. It's the result. Uh, this is why I think you see the director of the FBI raising the alarm. That is, we want to make sure people are aware of the risks that we're talking about. People are aware of where the technology is going so that we can actually have that informed conversation about how to balance principles one way or the other. But, but what we're talking about is a policy change that's happening on a very abstract level. The actual technology mandates certain things. Either you have a backdoor or a clipper chip or a key escrow, or you don't. So if you're ruling those things out, those things were ruled out in the 1990s, then what's there left to debate unless you have a concrete solution proposing something else? So. I, I think I can push back against that a little bit. I mean, uh, the, the the debate um, that we're having right here today goes to questions like what is the incremental risk, right? So what is the incremental risk of having law enforcement access if, uh, as as Jen and, and Heather and Amy have also pointed out, if your windows are wide open and uh, you keep all your valuables on the fire escape, um, then saying that it's a real problem to allow law enforcement to come in the door when they have a warrant doesn't ring as true. And that's what we have to sort of gauge, right? That is, um, what is the incremental risk from having law enforcement access, whatever the technological solution is, and is that incremental risk um, worth ruling out a centuries-long balance that we've drawn that in the appropriate case, there is available access for law enforcement? Can I, can I just, just to the panel? Yeah, just, yeah, just uh, <laughs> I want to get in the panel here. Um, is there a solution on the table. If we accept the premise that we're not talking about undermining encryption, if, D if we take DOJ at its word that they don't want some sort of breaking code that they can only have, is there something emerging that could possibly resolve some of these tensions? But feel free to respond as well. Oh, uh, so I don't, I don't have a solution. I, um, I, I know that Oren Kerr wrote some, some articles in the Washington Post and um, investigated some possible solutions. And I think, you know, some of that was around maybe um, uh, legislation that would uh, mandate uh, carriers to be able to access devices. This is very focused on phones, though, and Apple. Um, but I, I don't, I don't have a solution, unfortunately. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, though, because you know, as I said, I love analogies, and, and you had a nice analogy. Um, the windows are open, but your jewels are in the vault, and and you just drilled a hole in the vault. That's a little more accurate. Um, I got a little distracted there. No, I think. Um that, that there's not been a solution. I think, I think one of the big problems with this debate is that people are, aren't um, kind of outlining what their technical solution looks like, what they think, um, what they, think they can build that would implement their policy goal. Um, you know, lots of people have talked about various pieces of it. I know there's a lot of security technologists who have sat down and, and expressed disbelief that, that there could be a system that, that would check all of these boxes. Um, but I think that that would be a great next step in this discussion to, to actually put those on the table. So I think we, I mean, we have heard s solutions being proposed, and as soon as they're proposed, they are instantly knocked down. So every, or anybody who's in spate has heard of um, the, the infamous and magical golden key that could be somehow created to allow only certain people to access these back doors. And immediately after this was proposed, every single technologist I knew kind of threw up their hands um, and hid their heads because, because it's Deja and Tendu, and that's what I'm hearing from Dave as well. It's I've heard this all before, and we've already had this debate, and we've already decided that none of these solutions work. And so coming back to it again and again is, is very difficult, I think. And so the technologists are engaging and they basically have said what they said before. In fact, there are really, really great papers and comments and documents from the 1990s that could be published again today and you could just change the date on them and you would have no idea that they are um, two decades old. And so I think it's very interesting to talk about solutions because we haven't seen anything um, that's realistic that hasn't been batted down a thousand times. Yes. Just you. Mike Nelson, uh, I'm with Cloudflare, again, amazing coincidence. Um, <laughs> I, I was very involved in Crypto Wars 1.0. I was the civilian point man on these issues in the Clinton White House. And so I appreciate the challenge you have, David, defending this. 
you call for a conversation, but you, you have a very hard problem, which is that so much of the conversation is classified and only happens in skips. One of the hardest issues here is what happens to data that you collect for other countries. When I was at the White House, there was this terrible issue. We had a terrible time explaining when we would share data that the FBI or the CIA would collect with other countries. Can, can we even have a discussion about this? Because those countries don't want us talking about what we're giving them. So I think the best answer I can give to that is that it is absolutely right that this is an international problem. It's not just the United States, and it's not just our law enforcement or our national security authorities who are confronting the question of what to do um, when malicious actors have access to communications mechanisms or storage devices that cannot be penetrated. And I think you're absolutely right that the solution to that is going to have to be an international one because, um, again, this is not a struggle between the government and American companies. I think our interests are largely aligned in what we're trying to accomplish. Um, it, but this is a question of how do we make sure we have some means of preserving the principle that we agree on, that data should be accessed, um, without taking it off the table um, because of um, a perceived technological issue. So I, I obviously I'm not going to be able to answer the sort of initial underlying premise of your question one way or the other, but I think the insight is correct, which is that this is not an American government problem. This is also a problem the British government has talked about, and we're going to see other countries talking about it more and more as we go on. And what about earlier Amy's point um, that it's, it is hard for anyone not in DOJ to really argue about some of these issues because they don't have the full picture of sort of what you guys are up to, which I understand you can't start passing out open investigation files, but I mean, is there, is there a way to get over that information gap that we're also grappling with? Right, that's a great point. That's a great question. It was a good point that Amy raised. That is, there are two pieces to this. One is the discussion about principles uh, and what those principles are, and the second is how do we implement those principles, right? And if I was confident we had agreement on the principles, um, then I'd say let's move into the second piece right away. But I'm not confident we're there yet because when we articulate a principle like the one I've been trying to espouse throughout today's panel, you get pushback not of the kind that it is good for criminals to have access to data that can't be penetrated. No one's going to say that. We're all citizens of the same country. We all have the same fears. But the pushback is, is, is a, is a fact-based one, which is to say your principle is impossible. Your principle cannot be squared with data security, period. And I don't think that's a fair premise for this discussion. I think we have to acknowledge that there are trade-offs on both sides of it, and those principles um, are not mutually inconsistent, but we have to find a way to balance them, and we cannot allow one of them to trump the other. So when you talk about how do we say what we're up against, it's not complex in that if you're a child pornographer who is not a cryptography expert um, and you can access um, strong encryption that can't be cracked by anyone other than yourself, um, obviously you're going to migrate to that. Obviously if you are a violent gang that's trying to communicate about um, various um, activities related to your criminal activity and you know that if you use one text messaging service it can't be wiretapped, but if you know another can, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of sophistication. So the, the alarm bells we're sounding are not that this is a new theoretical problem. It's an old theoretical problem. It's an old real problem. Um, the alarm bells that you're hearing sounded is law enforcement saying this is becoming extremely common and extremely widespread. And in fact, uh, that's not being disputed. In fact, what we're hearing, I think, from other folks in the, in the debate is that it should be widespread. Everybody should have access to it. But you can't say that and say at the same time, it's not a problem. Convince me it's a problem. Because the, the entire premise of the discussion is everybody has access to it and more people should have access to it. And with the law-abiding folk, go the criminals. Uh, and so let's start with that principle discussion first, and then once we have an agreement about how to think about the trade-offs, then I think we'll be in a better position to move on to how to implement that. Please. I mean, I would say that those two things can coexist because we can have widespread access to encryption and to protected communications. Um, we have had pointed out that if all technologies have vulnerabilities that criminals will often not even use them anyway. They'll just build their own. So we're, what we're talking about is making the people in this room more secure, not necessarily making the bad guys more able to be caught. 
Um, but because there are ways, and there will always be ways, to go after bad guys in a very targeted situation, um, and whether or not that is getting, putting a wiretap on a phone or compromising the device, which we know people do, or stealing a SIM card um, and manipulating it and then having a lot of people put it into their phones, um, there are other ways around encryption. They're just not going to be able to be used on a bulk or a mass or a widespread scenario. They're going to have to be used in a more targeted instance. And also, there are not only, and this is, this is specifically getting to content, because we still have, from a security standpoint, this huge problem of the metadata, and it's a problem that we haven't been able to solve. And so we can't protect that necessarily yet. Um, and that is open to law enforcement, and oftentimes law enforcement feels like they can get at that without any sort of scenario or probable cause or process anyway. And so that is, I think, the biggest gap that we need to address. So I think that's, um, I, I, think, 30 seconds. I think that's conceptually wrong. That it's not a case of we identify a bad guy, how do we go after them and throw everything at them? So I'll just give you one example of a case that's, that's relatively recent. You have a case uh, that came out of uh, Miami in federal court just a couple of months ago. I think the conviction was at the end of December. Um, where an individual who was a long haul trucker kidnapped his girlfriend, um, imprisoned her within the truck, and drove her from state to state, um, uh, physically abusing her and sexually assaulting her. Um, and at some point, at, at a, when he stopped, she was able to escape from the truck, alert law enforcement, and seek to press charges against him for sexual assault and kidnapping. Um, his defense, unsurprisingly, was this was my girlfriend. We engaged in consensual sex, uh, and her, um, and her account was, no, this was not consensual. Now it so happens that the individual, while engaged in sexual assault, chose to video it on his smartphone and took an uh, 18 or 20 minute video of the sexual assaults taking place. Um, that uh, law enforcement was able to get a warrant, access that video, uh, and the video revealed quite plainly and in very disturbing fashion that this was non-consensual, this was sexual assault, and was able to be played for the jury, the gentleman was convicted. Um, and that's not a case where we would say, great, let's put more surveillance on him. Let's, put, um, let's go look at the metadata. That's not gonna solve that question. At the end of the day, the information that established the truth that mattered to take a dangerous person off the street and protect public safety was on a device. And if we couldn't decrypt that device, if we couldn't access that information, there's a harm to public safety. And so the folks who are arguing um, that we can't have law enforcement access have to own that problem. They have to say, we understand that. We understand that there are gonna be cases which law enforcement cannot solve, and they're bread and butter cases. These are the cases the local police are trying to do, that law enforcement are trying to do, thousands per year. And we're okay with that risk, because even though the stuff's flying out the windows and it's on the fire escape, making that lock even remotely possibly openable by law enforcement is unacceptable. And that's the, that's the position which I think is very difficult, but that's the position that, that I think you'd have to take in order to say law enforcement shouldn't have access. And I know there are responses, and we could continue this conversation for quite some time, uh, and I'm sure all the panelists would be happy to with you afterwards, but I am getting the hook. So we have to thank our panel and thank all of you for being here and thank the NET Caucus for uh, what I thought was a really wonderful discussion. Thank you.